It was early spring of 2017, right when the chill of winter began to loosen its grip on the world. You know that time of year when the sky is suddenly a brighter shade of blue, the air doesn't sting as much, and you start to feel a little spark of life in everything around you. That was the day, and that was the feeling. It was one of the first nice days we'd had in a while, so me, Lucas, and May decided to meet up after school to make the most of it. We all ended up at this old camping ground just a little way outside town. Lucas and I had been there a bunch of times with our families, barbecue weekends, the usual kid stuff. May, on the other hand, hadn't been before, so she was kind of excited to explore it with us. The place was technically still closed for the season, but the gate was unlocked, and there weren't any signs saying we couldn't be there. Plus, we'd never seen any rangers or park staff around this early in the year. It was quiet, almost too quiet, but at the time, we just thought it was peaceful. The trees were still bare, and the sun cast long, pale shadows across the ground as we wandered around. The air was cold but not biting, just enough to keep us alert. After about an hour of exploring, we found ourselves near this small forest behind a line of old cabins. They were weathered and a bit creepy, but we laughed it off, chalking it up to off-season neglect. Lucas pointed toward the trees and suggested we check out the woods since none of us had ever really ventured back there. We weren't doing anything wrong, just looking around. At least, that's what we thought. We walked deeper into the trees, laughing, joking around, and kicking up the dead leaves that had piled up over the winter. After a while, we started to head back toward the cabins when, out of nowhere, we heard a loud click. It was sharp, like metal snapping into place a sound that felt out of place in the quiet forest. We froze. I remember every single muscle in my body tensing up at that moment. Slowly, we turned around, and standing there, almost blending into the shadows, was a man. He was close, way closer than he should have been, and he was aiming a rifle right at us. He was older, maybe in his sixties, with a long, scraggly beard and eyes that seemed to pierce right through you. His face was twisted in anger, and there was something off about him, like he wasn't just angry. He was furious, practically shaking with rage. His finger hovered dangerously on the trigger, and he started shouting at us, demanding to know what we were doing. On his land! His voice was rough, cracking at the edges, and filled with a kind of hatred that sent chills down my spine. Who gave you the right to walk here? Think you can just sneak up and harm my family? He spat. His words didn't make much sense, but it was clear he believed every word of it. He wasn't just upset, he was convinced we were some kind of threat. We tried to explain ourselves, stumbling over our words as we told him we were just exploring, that we didn't know it was private property. Lucas raised his hands, trying to show we meant no harm. But every time we opened our mouths, he cut us off with another yell, telling us to shut up and keep quiet. We had no idea what to do. Here was this stranger, armed and furious, convinced we were trespassing with some twisted intent. The three of us just stood there, huddled together, trapped under the weight of his gaze and his weapon. Then, after what felt like hours but was probably closer to thirty minutes, a woman appeared from behind a tree. She was much younger than him, maybe in her early thirties, with pale skin and hollow cheeks. She walked up behind him with this almost eerie calm and looked us over as if we were animals caught in a trap. Why are you wasting time with them? She asked, her voice cold and detached. Just shoot them or call the cops. I felt my stomach drop. The way she said it, so casually, like our lives were completely disposable. Like we were just some nuisance to be dealt with. May grabbed my arm, her fingers digging in as if she was trying to anchor herself to something real something that wasn't terrifying. Lucas, who had always been the braver one of us, stepped forward just a bit and spoke up. Look, we're sorry. We didn't mean any harm. We'll leave now and never come back. His voice was steady, but I could see his hands were shaking. The man hesitated, glancing over at the woman as if he was waiting for her permission. For a second, I thought she'd nod, give him the go-ahead to do something unspeakable. But instead, she sighed, like letting us go was more trouble than it was worth. Fine, she said finally. 
but you'd better make sure they're gone. All the way gone. The man lowered his gun, his eyes still locked onto us. If I ever see you here again, he growled, I'll make sure you regret it. We didn't need to be told twice. As soon as he motioned for us to leave, we turned and bolted, running through the trees without a second glance. My legs felt like lead, but I didn't dare slow down. We tore through the woods, out past the cabins, and finally back to where our car was parked. We practically threw ourselves into the car, panting, our hearts pounding so hard I thought they'd burst. The moment we got in, Lucas fumbled with the keys, his hands still shaking as he tried to start the engine. And as if the universe had some twisted sense of humor, the song that started playing was It's Good to Be Alive Right Now by Andy Grammer. We just looked at each other, too shocked to laugh, but there was this unspoken feeling between us, we were lucky to be alive. Later, after we'd driven far enough away and our nerves had settled just a bit, we reported the incident to the camping ground management. They looked into it and eventually put up a bunch of no trespassing signs around the area. Apparently, the land we'd wandered onto was private property, even though it had never been marked as such. To this day, I can still remember the look in that man's eyes, the pure hatred and fearlessness, like he'd have pulled that trigger without a second thought. And the woman? She was even worse, with her cold, calculating stare and that casual suggestion to just shoot them. Every now and then, I think about what might have happened if Lucas hadn't kept his cool, if he hadn't talked us out of there. It was the kind of experience that gets under your skin, makes you look over your shoulder a little more often, and keeps you up at night, replaying every terrifying second. It was the summer of 1987, and our family took a trip out to the country, like we did every year. We stayed at Aunt Beth's old farmhouse just outside of town, surrounded by fields and woods that stretched as far as you could see. I was 13 back then, the oldest of us kids, and like every summer, I took it upon myself to be the leader of our gang of cousins. There were four of us that summer, my brother Charlie, who was nine, Emma, my 11-year-old cousin, and little Timmy, who was barely six. We weren't the closest of friends back home, but the minute we stepped onto that old farm, it was like we became a team. Our main mission that summer, as it had been in summers past, was simple. We were going to pick as many raspberries as we could from the wild bushes around the property. Now, the best berries always grew near this rundown old building at the far end of Aunt Beth's land. We called it the water house because, apparently, it used to be some sort of pump house that managed water for the property, and maybe even the surrounding farms. It was just a crumbling old structure then, walls covered in moss, roof half caved in. Nobody lived there, but there was something about it that always felt off. See, the water house had this reputation. Aunt Beth's neighbors used to talk about it in hushed tones, saying it was haunted, though no one would tell us why. We'd heard bits and pieces of the story over the years from some of the older kids around town. Supposedly, Back in the 60s, three bank robbers had holed up there after a heist gone wrong. They'd shot and killed a bank teller, a young guy just a few years older than me back then. The robbers, wounded and on the run, had hidden out in the waterhouse for months. No one knew exactly what happened to them, but when the police finally raided the place, they found their bodies, half rotten and riddled with bullet wounds. People said you could still hear strange noises around the waterhouse at night, low moans, whispers, sometimes even gunshots. Of course, we didn't believe any of it. I mean, we were kids, ghost stories didn't scare us. In fact, they made the water house even more exciting. So that afternoon, after lunch, we grabbed our buckets and headed out to the raspberry bushes, skirting along the edge of the fields until we reached the far side of Aunt Beth's property. It was a perfect day, blue sky, warm breeze, the smell of wildflowers in the air. We got lost in the picking, filling our buckets and eating half the berries as we went. But as the afternoon wore on, something changed. I remember it so clearly. The wind started to pick up, and clouds began to gather. The air grew thick, heavy in a way that made it feel like we were underwater. Even the birds went quiet. Charlie noticed it first. 
He looked up, a handful of berries frozen midair, and said, Do you hear that? We all paused, straining to listen. And then, faintly, from the direction of the water house, we heard it, a low, rhythmic thumping. Like footsteps, but slower. Louder. It was coming closer. Emma, who'd always been the most superstitious of us, grabbed my arm. We should go, she whispered. I don't like this. But I was thirteen, full of bravado and curiosity. I shrugged her off and told everyone to stay put. It's probably just some animal, I said even though, deep down, I wasn't so sure. I didn't want to admit it, but the sound was starting to get to me too. It had this strange cadence, like someone was limping, dragging one leg behind them. And it was coming from right behind the water house. Finally, curiosity got the better of me. I told the others to wait by the bushes and started creeping toward the building, trying to move as quietly as possible. The closer I got, the more my skin prickled. I don't know if it was fear or adrenaline, but something inside me screamed to turn around, to run. I ignored it. When I was maybe ten feet away from the water house, I stopped. I was close enough to see the building in detail now. The windows were cracked, the wood dark with mold. But in one of the windows, I saw movement. Something shifted in the shadows inside the building. I froze, hard hammering, and squinted, trying to make out what it was. Then I saw it, a face. A pale, twisted face with matted hair and hollow eyes that glowed yellow in the dim light. The mouth was stretched in a way that didn't seem human, revealing rows of teeth too sharp and too many. And it was staring right at me. I don't know how long I stood there, paralyzed, staring back at that thing. But then it moved slowly, lifting a hand covered in what looked like hair or moss. It raised a finger to its lips, as if to shush me, and that was enough. I turned and ran, bolting back toward the others without looking back. I didn't say anything, didn't need to, just grabbed Charlie and Emma by the shoulders and started pulling them along with me. They didn't argue, they could see the look on my face. We ran all the way back to the farmhouse, not stopping until we were safe inside. Aunt Beth gave us a funny look when we burst into the kitchen, gasping for breath, faces flushed. What's got you kids all spooked? She asked, chuckling. I opened my mouth, ready to tell her everything, but something stopped me. I didn't want her to know, didn't want her to laugh at me or worse, to go check it out herself. So I swallowed and forced a grin, brushing it off. Just saw some old drunk in the bushes, I said shrugging. Gave us a scare, that's all. The others exchanged glances, but none of them contradicted me. Aunt Beth laughed and shook her head, muttering something about city kids and their overactive imaginations. We let her believe it. That night, after everyone else was asleep, I lay awake in bed, staring at the ceiling. I couldn't shake the image of that face in the window. I kept seeing those yellow eyes, that twisted mouth. Every creak of the old house, every rustle of the wind outside made me flinch. Part of me wanted to go back, to see if it was still there, but a bigger part knew that I never would. The next morning, I told the others that we were done picking raspberries for the summer. Charlie protested, of course, but I didn't care. None of us went near the water house again. To this day, I don't know what I saw that summer. Maybe it was just a trick of the light, my imagination getting the best of me. But I can still see that face clear as day. And I'll tell you one thing, if you ever find yourself out near an old building, one that feels wrong, like it's holding on to something it shouldn't, just keep walking. Trust me. Some places are better left alone. When my dad was young, he had this one story that, even years later, he'd tell with a sort of reluctance, as if saying it aloud somehow made it feel too real, too close to him. To this day, he doesn't like talking about it much. And every time he did, he'd pause, look off into the distance, like he could see that night all over again in the back of his mind. I can still remember the way his voice would drop, just a little, like he didn't want the shadows around him to overhear. It was September of 1968. He was in his early twenties, just out of college, and still living close to home, 
a small town in New England. There was this trail about 30 minutes away from his house, a narrow, almost hidden footpath that wound through dense woods, mostly used by locals who knew it was there. It wasn't the kind of place you'd find by accident. It was remote, quiet, and even in daylight, there was this eerie stillness about it. On the weekends he'd drive up there to walk, especially when he needed to clear his head. He liked the solitude of it, the way he could be alone with his thoughts, away from the noise of the world. But that September, he told me, the air was different. A thick, uneasy quiet seemed to settle over the area, the kind that makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand up, as if the forest was waiting for something. On this particular day, my dad left for the trail later than usual, and by the time he got there, it was close to dusk. He planned on taking a shorter path back to his car before it got dark. The trail parking lot was nearly empty, except for a few scattered cars. But that day, there was something else parked there, a faded, old camper van. It was an unusual sight, even back then. The paint was peeling, and the windows were dark, as though whoever was inside didn't want anyone to see. He felt an immediate chill, something he couldn't explain as if the sight of that van alone was a warning. Ignoring the sinking feeling in his gut, he started his walk. At first, everything seemed fine, but as he got deeper into the woods, he began to sense something. He wasn't sure what it was at first. He just felt that subtle shift in the air, that prickling on his skin that told him he wasn't alone. After a few more minutes, he stopped, scanning the trees around him, but he didn't see anything. The woods were empty or at least, they looked empty. He shook it off, tried to convince himself it was just his mind playing tricks. Maybe it was the twilight casting strange shadows, or the quiet that felt just a bit too thick. But as he walked, the feeling only grew, like something was watching him from behind the trees. He found himself walking faster, his heartbeat picking up with every step. He didn't look back. He didn't want to. Halfway down the trail, there was a sharp bend, where the path turned right and dipped down a small hill. My dad told me he'd always hated that part of the trail. There was something about the way the trees clustered there, their branches low and twisted, casting shadows that seemed to move on their own. When he reached the bend, that sense of dread hit him full force, like an electric shock. He didn't even think, he just dropped to the ground, crouching behind a thick bush, holding his breath. The silence around him was almost deafening. And then he heard it. A rustling sound, like something moving through the brush, deliberate and careful, just a few feet away. He peered through the leaves, and his heart nearly stopped. There, not twenty feet from him, was a man. Tall, broad-shouldered, dressed in dark clothes, moving with an unsettling stillness, as though he was trying not to make a sound. The man's face was turned toward the path, eyes scanning, searching, almost as if he was hunting. My dad's mind raced. He didn't know who this guy was or what he wanted, but he knew one thing, he couldn't stay hidden there forever. The man was close, far too close, and all he had to do was turn his head a fraction, and he'd see my dad crouching there. In a split second, my dad made a decision. He took a deep breath, then bolted, tearing through the undergrowth and heading back towards the main trail. He didn't stop to see if the man followed. He didn't dare. His footsteps thundered in his ears, drowning out everything else. But even through the noise, he could hear it, the sharp snap of branches, heavy footsteps pounding after him. He didn't look back. He didn't want to know how close the man was. He just kept running, lungs burning, legs screaming, pushing himself faster than he'd ever run in his life. And then, up ahead, he saw it the break in the trees, the edge of the trail where it opened out onto the road. He burst onto the road, skidding to a stop, gasping for air. But he wasn't safe yet. He could still feel that man's presence, lurking just beyond the trees, watching him. He didn't waste a second. He sprinted towards the parking lot, where his car was the only vehicle left, except for that camper van. The sight of it filled him with a fresh wave of fear, but he didn't stop. He dove into his car, fumbling for the keys, his hands shaking so badly he almost dropped them. Finally, he managed to start the engine, and as he backed out, he saw him, the man, 
standing at the edge of the parking lot, right next to the camper van, watching him with a dark, expressionless gaze. He didn't move, didn't shout, didn't try to chase my dad. He just stared like he was memorizing his face, committing it to memory. My dad hit the gas, speeding down the narrow road, not daring to look in the rearview mirror. But as he left, he couldn't shake the feeling that the man was still watching, that somehow, he'd see him again. For weeks after that, my dad avoided the trail, tried to put the whole thing out of his mind. But the memory lingered, a shadow in the back of his thoughts. Eventually, he told the story to a park ranger, hoping maybe they'd find something, anything, that would explain what he saw. But nothing came of it. No one ever saw that camper van again, and no one could tell him who the man was or why he was out there. After that, my dad stopped walking that trail alone. He'd only go with a friend, and always in daylight. He said the woods never felt the same to him again, not after that night. And even though he never saw the man again, he'd sometimes feel that same prickling sensation, that eerie sense of being watched, whenever he went near the forest. It was one of those bone-chilling winter days in Wisconsin, the kind where the air bites at your cheeks and your breath hangs thick and heavy in the dusk. My friend Cassie and I had been going to Grant Park for years, and though we were warned to be careful after dark, it had always felt like our special place. A safe, quiet stretch of forest and trails, full of places to explore and things to capture with our cameras. We used it as inspiration for our role-playing games, where we dreamed up worlds of heroes and villains, hiding and chasing each other among the tall oaks and snow-laden paths. But that night, it didn't feel safe. It started innocently enough. Just Cassie and me, wrapped up in coats and scarves, our gloved hands clutching cameras and notebooks. The park was blanketed in thick snow, muffling every sound but the crunch of our boots. The whole world felt frozen like we'd stepped into a snow globe that no one had shaken for years. There were patches of light filtering through the trees, cast by street lamps scattered around the park. But in the growing twilight, shadows clung to every surface. We'd been to the park in winter before, even with our guy friends. Nothing ever happened beyond the occasional creepy sound of branches snapping underfoot. But this was the first time Cassie and I were alone this late. I remember feeling that faint buzz of unease though I shrugged it off. Nothing ever happened here. This was our place. As we reached a spot near the main trail, we stopped to take some pictures of the skeletal trees silhouetted against the deepening blue sky. I was focused on getting the angle just right when I heard the faint hum of a car. No big deal, right? Grant Park is bordered by a few small roads. But as I looked up, I saw headlights peeking through the trees and coming closer. I remember frowning, wondering why a car would be this far into the park. Then I saw it. A beat-up old truck, slowing to a crawl as it passed us. Inside, two men were leaning out the windows, their faces obscured by shadows. They were yelling something, their voices sharp and cutting through the silence. Cassie nudged me, her eyes wide with worry, and whispered, Just ignore them. So we did. We kept our heads down and tried to act like we hadn't noticed them at all, but I could feel their stares boring into us, even as they drove off. We breathed a sigh of relief, thinking it was over. But just as we relaxed, the sound of the truck's engine came back. It was looping around, returning to us slower this time, like they were stalking us. They called out again, their words slurred and indistinct, but one thing was clear, they wanted us to come closer. Hey girls! We just wanna talk! We didn't stop to think. Cassie grabbed my arm, and we took off running into the woods. The snow made everything slower, harder. Every step seemed to sink us deeper, pulling us down as we stumbled over hidden rocks and roots. Behind us, the truck's headlights illuminated our path, casting grotesque shadows that seemed to stretch and bend with each movement. I could still hear them shouting, laughing, like it was all just some sick game. At some point, we lost them. The truck had stopped following us, but the dark, empty woods felt no safer. We crouched behind a thick clump of trees, trying to catch our breath, 
hearts pounding so loud I thought they might hear us. After what felt like an eternity, we made our way back to the path and eventually found our way home. The next time we went to Grant Park, we were with friends again, our guy friends. Somehow, the memory of that night had dulled, replaced with laughter and the sense that maybe it had been a one-time scare, a fluke. We visited the park a couple more times, always with the guys, and nothing happened. The shadows didn't seem so long. The woods didn't feel so suffocating. For a while, it was back to normal. Until we went alone again. It was late in January when Cassie and I, armed with our cameras, decided we'd go to the park by ourselves. The sky was a cold, washed-out gray, the kind that turns everything beneath it into a shadow. I remember thinking how empty it felt as we walked down the main path, taking pictures and laughing about some silly inside joke. But a heaviness hung in the air, something almost oppressive. As we approached the bridge, that same rumble reached our ears. The sound of a car approaching. I froze, an icy feeling twisting in my gut. We turned to see another car coming down the path. This time, it wasn't just two men. There were four of them, along with a woman in the back seat, her head lolling as if she'd fallen asleep, or worse. They yelled at us, insults and taunts that sent a cold shiver down my spine. It was more aggressive this time. Not just playful jeers, but venomous, harsh words meant to unsettle us. Cassie and I exchanged a look, terror flashing in her eyes. And then, without a word, we bolted. The car sped up, their laughter echoing as they followed us, staying just close enough to make sure we knew they were right there. I could hear one of them yell, We just wanna play! In a mocking tone, his words twisted with a cruel edge that sent a jolt of adrenaline through me. We reached the bridge, and that's when we made a choice. Instead of running across, we veered off to the side, climbing down a small embankment and sliding behind a concrete barrier. The rough surface scraped against our legs, but we didn't care. We huddled there, pressed up against the cold, unforgiving stone, trying to become invisible. The car had stopped near the bridge, their voices still drifting through the air, searching for us. Where'd they go? I could hear one of them getting out, footsteps crunching in the snow. I didn't dare look. Every inch of me was screaming to run, but I knew that any movement would give us away. Cassie's hand gripped mine so tightly that my fingers ached, but it was the only thing anchoring me in that moment. Just when I thought they'd find us, the voices drifted away, the car door slammed, and the vehicle pulled off. But we weren't safe. Not yet. We crawled out from our hiding spot and sprinted toward the nearest houses, stumbling through the snow-covered tennis courts in a blind panic. There was a brief moment where I thought they might see us again, catch our fleeing figures darting across the snow. But they didn't. We reached the edge of the park, our breath coming in ragged gasps, every muscle in my body screaming as we stumbled onto a street, past the houses, and finally reached our car. Only then did we feel safe enough to speak. Cassie's face was pale, her voice shaking as she muttered, We're never doing this alone again. The next day, we told our friend Jake what had happened. He listened in silence, his jaw set, and after we finished, he promised that he'd come with us whenever we wanted to go back. And he did. He and a couple of our other friends would accompany us, their presence a comforting shield against the shadows lurking at the edges of the park. But I never forgot that night. The sense that something malevolent had followed us, even if just for those few hours. The feeling that the woods, once our haven, held secrets that were better left undisturbed. To this day, every time I walk down a snowy path in Grant Park, I feel that flicker of fear, the echo of their laughter in the back of my mind. And I know that, somehow, we were lucky that night. Because sometimes, people don't just want to play. It happened when I was 10 years old, a lifetime ago now, though it feels like yesterday. It was me, Colin, and Skylar. We were best friends, the inseparable kind of best friends you only really have when you're a kid. We did everything together, every single day after school and on weekends. But our favorite thing to do? Exploring. We lived on the edge of a small town bordered by thick woods. 
To us, those woods were endless and magical, a place where anything could happen. We'd go in there for hours, pretending we were explorers, hunters, or sometimes even detectives on a big case. But one day, deep in the woods, we stumbled upon something unexpected. It was an old cabin, half hidden by tall trees and covered in moss and vines. It looked like it had been abandoned for years, maybe decades. Windows broken, door hanging crookedly on one rusty hinge, it looked like something out of a ghost story. But to us, it was the coolest thing we'd ever seen. We decided right then and there that it was going to be ours, a secret base, a hideout, a place just for the three of us. Skylar was always the creative one, and she had big plans for our cabin. Over the next few days, we brought things from home, old blankets, some snacks, and a couple of flashlights. We cleaned out the debris and hung up our decorations, including an old map we found in Colin's garage. It didn't matter that it was half falling apart, to us, it was perfect. But the most important part? The secret knock. Skylar insisted we needed a special knock so no one else could get in. She came up with this little rhythm, three knocks, then a pause, then two knocks. We practiced it over and over until we all had it down perfectly. It was silly, maybe, but it made the cabin feel truly ours. Everything was great for a while. We'd meet there every day after school, hang out, tell stories, make up adventures. It was the best part of my day. But then, then things changed. I remember the day so clearly, even though I wish I didn't. That day, Colin didn't show up. He told us at lunch he'd meet us at the cabin, so we weren't sure what happened. Skylar and I waited for a while, just talking and goofing around, but as it started to get late, we began to worry. We kept hoping to hear his knock at the door, that little rhythmic pattern we all knew so well. Then, we did hear a knock. But, something was wrong. It wasn't the secret knock. It was just a loud, heavy bang, followed by another. And another. No pauses, no rhythm, just this relentless, angry pounding on the door. Skylar and I froze, staring at each other. Maybe it's Colin messing with us. She whispered, though she didn't sound convinced. Maybe he forgot the knock. But even as she said it, I could see in her eyes that she didn't believe it. I didn't either. There was something off about it, something too aggressive, too desperate. We didn't open the door. We just sat there, listening as the banging got louder and louder, rattling the cabin like it was about to come off its hinges. Then, just as suddenly as it had started, it stopped. Silence filled the cabin. I reached out for Skylar's hand, and her fingers were ice cold. Slowly, we got up and crept to the door, opening it a crack. There was no one there. Not a footprint, not a broken twig, nothing. Just the dark, empty woods stretching out in every direction. We didn't wait around. We ran out of the cabin and all the way home, breathless and terrified. The next day, we found out why Colin hadn't come. His mom told us he'd come down with a high fever after school and had been taken to the hospital. He'd been so sick he couldn't even lift his head, much less make it out to the woods. But then, who knocked on the door? Skylar and I tried to brush it off, to pretend it was just some weird prank, or maybe even a figment of our imagination. But that night, I couldn't shake this feeling like something was outside my window, watching. I told myself it was just leftover fear from the cabin, but part of me knew better. It was late, maybe around midnight when I heard it. That knock. The same pattern we'd created, three knocks, pause, two knocks, only now it was coming from the other side of my bedroom door. My parents were asleep, and I knew they wouldn't be up just to play a prank on me. I lay there, barely breathing my heart pounding as I listened. The knock came again. I wanted to scream, to run to my parents' room, but I was frozen. I could feel a cold sweat break out on my forehead, and I squeezed my eyes shut, hoping it would stop. Then my phone rang. I jumped about a foot in the air. When I looked at the screen, I saw an unknown number. Against my better judgment, I picked up. There was silence on the other end for a moment, and then... In a voice I didn't recognize, someone whispered. Open the door. I dropped the phone, my hands shaking uncontrollably. 
I don't know how I got through that night, but somehow, I managed to stay in bed until morning. When I finally went downstairs, my mom noticed I was pale and asked if I was okay. I told her I hadn't slept well, which was the understatement of the century. The next day, I went to school, hoping I could talk to Skylar, hoping she'd tell me it was all in my head. But when I found her, she looked as bad as I felt. She pulled me aside and whispered that she'd heard the knock too. It had come to her house, in the middle of the night, just like it had come to mine. Neither of us had any answers. All we knew was that ever since that night at the cabin, something had changed. It was like we'd brought something back with us, something that wasn't bound to the woods anymore. It was in our lives, watching us, waiting. We never went back to the cabin. We didn't talk about it either, not really. We just drifted apart over time, each of us haunted by those memories in our own way. Years later, I heard that Skylar had moved away, far away, without telling anyone. Colin too. I never saw either of them again after high school. I stayed in town though, and every now and then, I think about those days, about that cabin. And every now and then, I still hear that knock. Three knocks, a pause, then two more.